Well, welcome Saddleback this weekend. All of our campuses, thrilled that you're here. We're in the midst of this series on how do you begin to rethink your life. And let me just give you a quick review. If this is your first week here, you haven't been for a few weeks, this will help you. If you've been the last several weeks, I hope it'll just remind you of where we've been. Uh, Pastor Rick started off these series the first couple of weeks by talking first about the power of what you think and how it can actually change your life. And then he talked to us about how to begin to learn to think like Jesus, looking at the example of Jesus. And last week, Pastor Buddy and Jeremiah talked to us about rethinking our view of ourselves. And throughout this series, uh, one of the themes has been redefining a word that's found in the Bible, and we use it a certain way in the Bible, and we use it a totally different way in our culture right now. And it's the word repent which is a negative word in our culture, uh, an ugly word about bad things and bad people, and it's always said in angry ways. But in the Bible, the word repent just means to turn around, to think in a different way, to make a U-turn. It's one of the most beautiful words in the Bible. And so we're trying to recapture, because that word is used so often in the Bible, what it really means, that God wants you to rethink your life, to think in a different way. And this week, Pastor Tosh and I are gonna be talking about how do you rethink your view of God? Last week, rethink your view of yourself. This week, how do you rethink your view of God? A.W. Tozer famously said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It is important because it determines what you think about God, whether you even think about God, even if you don't think about God, the way that you think about God determines the way you look at your problems. It determines the way that you look at your future. It determines the way that you look at your relationships. All the important things in life revolve around how you think about God. So as we think about God these next few moments together, I wanna to begin with an extremely obvious truth. And it's, it's based on Psalm 145, verse three, the first verse that's in your program and your outline. The Bible says this about God. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. So God's greatness cannot be measured. And to think that Tosh and I could somehow measure out God's greatness for you in the next few minutes is absolutely ridiculous. How could we, human beings made by God, use the mouths that God made to somehow convey to you the greatness of God? It can't be measured. No human being, no human mind can even measure it. All of us together, that's how great God's greatness is. So that's not gonna be our task. We cannot describe to you the greatness of God, but we can pass along to you some of the things that God says about himself in his word and hope that that's an encouragement, hope that that's a strength. One of the questions we all have to ask ourselves is, how do you come up with your view of God? And there's a lot of different ways. It's very tempting to come up with your view of God based on your circumstances. This happened to me, this doesn't happen to me, and because of that, that's what I think of God. That's my view of God. The problem is our experience is so limited. We're, we're just a, a single person and my experiences right now are just a part of my life. And my life is just a part of billions of lives over thousands and thousands of years. And to think that my one life and those one experiences could define a God whose greatness cannot be measured is a, is a ridiculous thing really. It, it's sort of like basing your view of baseball on the one game that you went to. And the game got rained out after the first pitch in the first inning. And that's how you're gonna base your entire view of baseball. God is greater. And so you don't base your sense of who God really is upon your circumstances. You base it on what God has said about himself. And he wants us to know who he is. He's told us who he is again and again. So based on what he's shown us, we're gonna spend the rest of this message looking at six ways to change your life by rethinking your view of God. How does God say you can begin to change your life by rethinking your view of who he is? And for some of you, I know this message is gonna be a message of assurance. These are truths you've known for a long time. So you're just gonna hear them again. But this is an assurance I need every week of my life because this is the truth that we stand on. Others of you, honestly, this is a message you really don't wanna hear because right now you're mad at God. Right now, you're tired of God. I mean, you came to be kind to somebody in your family or a friend or because you've come before, but the truth is you're mad at God, you're tired of God, and you don't even wanna think about this stuff. My, my prayer is that something in what we say will remind you of the love of God. But I know that ultimately, you gotta work this out between you and God. It's an issue between you and he. For some of you, this message is gonna radically alter your life. 
because God is so big and what we think about him is so important. When we change how we think about God, it has the promise of changing everything about us. So God's gonna use his word to point out some new way to think about God that's gonna radically alter your life, begin you on a path that you never expected in your life. So based on that, we're gonna look at these six ways to change your life by changing your thinking about God, beginning with number one. First thing you can do, God's word says, is you can accept his unconditional love. Accept his unconditional love. God is love, the book of James tells us. And so you begin to rethink your view of God by accepting his unconditional love. Now, it's unconditional. What does that mean, unconditional love? Well, first it means you can't do anything to earn it. It's not conditioned on something you do. It's unconditional love. Ephesians 2.8 talks about this. For it is by God's grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. You have to earn a living, but you can't earn love. You can't earn hope. You can't earn grace. You can't earn assurance or forgiveness or faith. And once you accept that, I mean, to the core of your being, accept that, an overwhelming peace floods into your life, a kind of peace that you never thought possible. The Bible says in Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Now, this sense of peace that I'm talking about, sometimes we fall away from that peace because we start treating the gift as a gift. Did you ever get a gift that really wasn't a gift? Maybe at work you got a big bonus, like as a gift, or a vacation trip, or some, some big gift at work, and you realize it was a nice thing, but it really wasn't a gift. What was given to you was saying, you did great, now we're expecting even more from you, right? The gift wasn't a gift, it was an expectation. And sometimes we do that with God's gift. We turn God's gift into an expectation. God gave us so much, his grace is so big. Now he's expecting more and more from me. And all the peace goes right out of our lives because you've stopped treating it like a gift. There's an entire book in the Bible about this, the book of Galatians. Paul wrote to the people in Galatia and said, what, what are you trying to do? Trying to earn now what only God could give. And he called them foolish for doing this. And it is foolish to think somehow I could earn what only God could give. Unconditional, it's an unconditional gift. Are you trying to earn what God has given? That's one of the questions we have to ask ourselves. And if you are, that's a point in life to start to rethink your life. Unconditional love means you can't do anything to earn it, but it means something else. Unconditional also means you can't do anything to lose it. It's unconditional. So that means you can't do anything to lose it. You can't lose it because you didn't earn it. If you'd earned it, you could lose it, but God gave it and God has promised that he's not gonna take it away. Your relationship with God, it's not based on your belief about yourself. It's based on what God says about you. We talked about that this last week. And the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse five. God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Now, the, the never of an eternal and perfect God, it's different than our never. And sometimes we say never, and we sort of mean it, but it doesn't really work out that way. A after a, a long Christmas season, lots of candies, lots of sweets, some of us said on January 1, I am never gonna eat sugar again. How's that working out? You know, sometimes our never lasts for like two weeks. Or we say, I am never gonna be like my mom or like my dad. How about that one? Never. Or I'm never gonna be in a minivan. Some of you said that to yourselves, and now you're in a minivan with your five kids in the back. That's where you are. Our never is not like God's never. We, we might even mean it sometimes, but we don't have the power that God has. When God says never, he means never. He's an eternal God. He will never break his promise. He's an almighty God. He will never break his promise. And God says to you, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Take that in. Now, as we talk about this, I know that all of our campuses, there, there are two groups of people right now. Just like for the past 2,000 years, there have been two groups of people as we talk about this truth of God's unconditional love. 
There's one group of people who you, you know you can't earn God's love. You're absolutely convinced of it. I, I can't earn God's love. But somewhere inside of you, you're, you're pretty convinced that you're racking up a few more points with God than all those other people who can't earn God's love. You just got a little bit ahead of all those other people. Rethink. Rethink. We're all in the same boat. And this attitude that somehow I am better than this person who has these struggles, you don't know what they went through. You don't know how God's gonna look at their lives and say how much better they were doing in the end than you. Rethink and recognize we're all sinners. We're all in total need of God's grace. Live in that place. That's the place of peace. That's the place of security. And there's a second group of people out there. And you're absolutely convinced that God could never love you. Maybe because of something you did, something you said, something you believed, something that happened to you. You're convinced God could never truly love me. Maybe you feel like you had his love and you lost it. Maybe you feel like you've never had it. I want to encourage you, rethink. It's unconditional love. It's not something you can earn so he can give it to any of us. He's willing to give it to you. It's unconditional love. It's not something that you can lose. His love is still there with you right now. There's a second way that you and I can change our lives by rethinking our view of God, and that is to appreciate his holiness. As you're writing that down, Pastor Tosh is gonna come and share this point with us. Would you give him a warm Saddleback welcome? <laughs> when we think about the when we have to appreciate the holiness of God, we first need to start by trying to understand what the holiness of God is. When we say that God is holy, we say that he is perfect and he is pure. There isn't even a trace of evil in his character. He doesn't do anything wrong. And when we start talking about his purity, that's a great start to talk about his holiness, but it actually goes further. God's holiness means that he is entirely unique in how great he is. He's completely set apart above everyone and everything else. Nothing exists that compares to his perfection or greatness. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, no one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. This type of holiness means that when God puts his name on something, you can take it to the bank. All of God's promises, you can count on. His, his holiness makes him entirely trustworthy. Look at Psalm 33, it says, in him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. And that alone gives us enough reason to celebrate and appreciate his holiness. But actually, when we talk about holiness, there's another element that we have to discuss. And, and you might have actually felt a little, bit, a little bit of this when I first started talking about holiness. Holiness causes a separation from whatever, whatever is unholy. And it makes sense. By definition, anything that is perfect can't have anything imperfect in it. Anything that is entirely pure can't have any impurities in it. I wanna give you this example. What if you went on a, a nice long um, hike or you went on a jog on a nice summer day and you come back and you're, you're tired, you're thirsty, and I give you a nice big tall glass of clean, crisp water. And I say, hey, you, you must be thirsty, have some water. There's just a little bit of flesh eating bacteria in it. <laughs> Do you want some? It's just a little bit of bacteria. <laughs> you wouldn't drink it because it doesn't make any sense. It's been polluted, it's been corrupted. It's imperfect now. God's holiness is so far above anything else. And the problem is that my imperfection makes me separate from him. If you have ever felt far from God, if you've ever felt like God is this incredible deity and I can't approach him, then I want you to hear this. God has a solution. See, Jesus, he took all of my unholiness. He took all of my sin and he put all of that disobedience on himself and he put it to death with him. That's why Jesus died on the cross. If you've ever wondered why did God die, it was to put to death all of our unholiness and sin. 
Because of that, God is able to offer us forgiveness and grace. And if you have accepted that incredible gift, then God takes you, he classifies you as holy and set apart for him. That's awesome. God's holy presence is not just something to be observed from far away. It's something that he actually has provided a way for us to enter into. Isaiah 57, 15 says, I am the high and holy God who lives forever. I live in a high and holy place, but I also live with people who are humble and repentant, there's that word again, so that I can restore their confidence and hope. When we appreciate his holiness and when we accept his forgiveness, we are transformed and we will actually dwell with him, with the holy God who lives high above forever. If you've been standing back and just watching God from afar, then you're missing out what God actually wants for you. He wants to remain close to you. He wants you to restore your hope and confidence. Guys, God doesn't use his holiness to just keep us away. <laughs> he actually invites us in to join in, in his perfect holiness for eternity. God's holiness, it's a barrier to everything that's impure and imperfect, but his grace transforms us so that we can enter in. So instead of ignoring his greatness, instead of staying away from his holiness, will you accept his grace and ask him to be close? Will you accept him as the holy God who wants to live with you? The third way that we need to rethink our view of God is to trust his judgment. Most people have a, a wrong understanding of God's judgment because they just think of God's wrath. But if we really wanna understand God's judgment, it has to start with his wisdom. God is the pinnacle of wisdom. God created everything and he knows everything. He understands how everything works and he, he knows what everything is meant for. God knows the best uh, situ solution for every situation and he knows what's best for me. Trusting God's judgment, it means that I recognize that he alone is the one to judge what is right and wrong. He is the one who understands what's safe and what's harmful. He determines what's good and bad. To put it simply, God's judgment is always right. Romans 9, 20 says, who in the world do you think you are to second guess God? Do you for one moment suppose any of us knows enough to call God into question? Clay doesn't talk back to the finger that molds it saying, why did you shake me like this? Whatever situation you're in right now, God understands and he already has the best solution. He wants you to find wisdom and hope in him. So God's wisdom can help us every day, but it actually goes well beyond our daily lives. See, God's master plan is to guard his family forever from evil and from suffering. In order to do that though, one day God will judge and destroy anything that doesn't meet his perfect standard. And you know what, that could be a little terrifying, right? We just talked about we don't meet his perfect standard. But I wanna clarify something. God's objective has never been to punish and destroy. His goal is actually to save. Let's see what John 3.17 says. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world guilty. That was not his purpose, but to save the world through him. Jesus came to save the world. Anyone, anyone willing to accept his forgiveness and to follow him is saved. And we actually become part of his family. And this is really cool. We don't have to fear judgment as part of God's family. God does not punish his children. He corrects and he disciplines each one of his children for their benefit. Hebrews 12, seven says, be patient when you're being corrected. This is how God treats his children. He doesn't, uh, uh, don't all parents correct their children? I have five amazing little girls. Yeah, five little, <laughs> uh, and, and I absolutely love them. You know, when my two-year-old figured out how to open the front door, she developed this really bad habit. She would go to the front door and she would open it and just run outside 
without anybody else there. I had to really quickly train her to teach. I had to teach her and correct her. And trust me, she didn't want me to train her and correct her. She didn't like that. She liked the freedom of going and doing whatever she wanted. But she had no idea the terrible things that could happen to a two-year-old wandering alone in the street. Guys, every time we disobey God, we unwittingly allow danger and problems into our lives. If you're running away from God's judgment, if you don't even wanna know what God says is right or wrong, then you don't understand his perspective. You're missing out on God's good plan for you. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a path before each person that seems right. We feel like that's the right thing, but it ends in death. And Proverbs 3, 6 says, think about him, God, in all your ways, and he will guide you on the right paths. Trusting God's judgment is trusting in his wise protection for your life. God is not a warden to escape. He is a father to run to. Are you gonna trust in your own judgment or in the judgment of God? Will you accept what God says is right as right and will you accept what he says is wrong as wrong? I know that I want to experience the peace and security of following in his truth always. That's what I want for you too. The fourth way that we need to rethink our view of God is by understanding his timing. The reality is there are a lot of horrible things that we experience, that we endure, that are just not good in any way. And I know that there are some of you today that are going through incredibly difficult situations. Maybe you're wondering, why does God allow this to continue? Or why doesn't God just give me what I need to end this now? There are a lot of things we just don't understand. Psalms 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. God says to wait for him. Don't give up. God's timing is perfect, and I know it doesn't always feel like that, it doesn't always seem that way, but that's because God's perspective is bigger. If I were to watch part of a movie, just right, right when it gets into the conflict, right when it gets into the part that's all confusing, and walk away and say, I don't like it, this movie doesn't make any sense. Well, of course it doesn't make sense, I haven't made it to the end, I gave up. God sees the big picture, and he's working everything out in the best way for his whole family. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord isn't slow about keeping his promises, as some people think he is. In fact, God is patient because he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be lost. So we tend to think that God is being slow because we think that God should be working according to the way that we think, according to our timeline. And on my timeline, I think in days and months, maybe even years, but God's timeline stretches over eternity. And he holds everything in the balance. God has a bigger picture and a bigger purpose even when we don't see it. And he is patient to act at just the right moment. Isaiah 55, eight says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. God has it figured out. When God has me wait, it's because he has a different way of thinking about it. And by the way, his way of thinking is always better than mine. But you know, I, I know that that can be frustrating. I, I understand the frustration. See, I, I used to be an engineer. I studied computer engineering. I was in the aerospace field for uh, 10 years. And I love to have my plans. <laughs> if you're an engineer, if you know an engineer, you love to have a design. You give me a plan and I will go after it. And so I said to God, God, give me your plan. What do you want me to do? Show me the map of my life and where I need to head towards, and I'll go after it. And I kept getting frustrated time and time again, thinking, God, isn't this what you want me to ask of you? Just give me this map, and I will go after it. But God showed me something that just helped me realize how much I was turned around. He said, I'm not here to give you a map to get more things done. I'm here to be your guide. 
See, if I were to see a map, the first thing I would do, just take off. <laughs> let's, go, let's go find what I need to do. But God said, I don't want you to fix your eyes on that map. I want you to fix your eyes on me. The journey isn't about how far I go or how much I accomplish. It's about who I'm taking every step with. And I realized that my, complete, my thinking was completely off. Guys, there's a principle that's so important. Every time I, got, I doubt God's timing, it reveals a missing piece in my understanding of God. And that, that principle translates to everything that I'm waiting for. When I was waiting for a spouse, God wanted me to first look at him to find my confidence and my value. When I, waiting, when I was waiting for healing from different physical problems, God wanted me to know that it's not what I do that makes him love me. When I was waiting for financial help to get me through into the next day, to the next step, God wanted to show me that he, is, he has unlimited resources to provide everything that I need to accomplish what he has asked me to do. See, it's in the waiting that I have the best opportunity to learn something that is more valuable, that he is greater than what he gives to me. God wants you to put your trust in him, not in what he gives you. So at the right time, when he does give you what you have been needing and wanting, you worship the giver and not the gift. Our misunderstanding about God's timing often spills out of our misunderstanding about who God is. And, and we think God's timing is off because it, it's sort of like we've been ordering all these packages. God, I need this, I need that. Will you deliver this for me? Will you deliver that for me? And we're standing at the door looking at our watch and saying, God, why aren't you here yet? My delivery isn't here. And we make God small, we turn him into a delivery man. See, God doesn't merely, merely deliver the things that we need. He's the very essence of everything that we need. He's our hope. He's our savior. He's our salvation. Guys, God is not the delivery man. He's the deliverer. So will you use your time of waiting to ask him to show you something bigger? Will you choose to trust his timing and wait with confidence that he will be your deliverer for everything that you need. Point number five is to respect his strength. And Pastor Tom is gonna take it from here. So you wanna change your life by rethinking your view of God? Fifth thing you gotta do is respect his strength. God is strong. He's powerful, he's a place of safety, a place of security. And you respect his strength when you call on his help. You, you respect his strength when you rely on his strength, when you lean on his strength. Instead of relying on your strength alone, God, I got this one, God, I don't wanna bother you with this one, you realize that he wants to be involved in your life and you lean on him, you rely on his wisdom, you li rely on his strength in your life, as you make decisions, as you head forward, as you encounter struggles and problems in your life, you say, God, I need your strength. Psalm 18 verse two says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. So to respect his strength means you're, you're leaning on God. That's the obvious one. But there's another not so obvious way that you respect God's strength. You respect God's strength when you stop pretending that he's weak. Respect God's strength when you recognize him for who he really is. You respect God's strength when you stop pretending that God doesn't notice when you take him for granted. When you stop pretending that you can live any way that you want and still love God with all your heart. And too many of us pretend. Too many of us struggle with this. A lot of followers of Jesus Christ live basically the same life as their neighbor next door who's not following Jesus Christ. No, no difference. And sometimes it's because we don't respect his strength. The Bible says in Romans 2, 4, or did you think that because he's such a nice God, he'd let you off the hook? Better think this one through from the beginning. God is kind, but he's not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and he leads us into radical life change. 
that phrase, radical life change, it's the word repentance. God's kindness leads us to repentance. If you're waiting for God to like bring out the big guns before you change your life, like when he really messes with me, messes things up, takes things away, he's gonna bring out the big guns, then I'll know it's time. If you're waiting for that, you don't understand God. God leads us with kindness. He leads us with patience. He leads us with love. He has enough strength to do that. It's like you with a two-year-old. You have enough strength that you're not really worried about them overpowering you. You can be kind, you can be gracious. And God is kind and gracious with you. He lovingly leads us towards life change. And to really change, to really change, I need to respect the strength that's behind that kindness. Electricity is kind to us. I mean, it brings us lights, it brings us heat, you know, it brings us entertainment, it's, it's kind to us. But it's a good thing to respect the strength that's behind electricity. Sometimes I'm working at my house and I'm, I'm changing out an outlet or a light switch and I'm, I'm, I'm too lazy to go out the box and, and flip the, 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 the jumper. So I, so I decided I'll just open the, you're laughing because you've done it too, you know what I'm talking about. I'll just open it up, I'll change this one, one wire and I learn again to respect the strength of electricity. I get a jolt that reminds me, I should respect the strength. I should respect the strength. And God says, I want you to respect my strength that's behind my kindness. I gotta tell you, I'm embarrassed to think of how often I've taken advantage of his kindness. By not changing when I knew I needed to change, by not thinking differently when I knew that I needed to think differently, and, and waiting too long to have the faith, to take the step of faith that I knew, knew I needed to take. I took advantage of his kindness. Instead of being motivated by his kindness, that's what I want for my life and your life too. I wanna to be motivated by his kindness and his love into this kind of radical life change that we're talking about. And God says that's what's the highest motivation of all. When you respect his strength, you're motivated by his kindness. Now there's a final way, a sixth way that you and I can begin to see our lives changed by rethinking our view of God, and that is to enjoy, to really enjoy his presence, to, to enjoy being with him. God wants you to enjoy being with him because God has a lot to offer to you. The Bible says in Psalm 16, 11, just one of many verses about this in the Bible, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures at your right hand. God says, that's what I wanna offer you, by being in my presence. Because God is so much greater than us, we, we tend to think that he's somehow far from us because he's so much greater, like a, a mountain range, it's big, it's great, it's far from us. But that's not the truth at all. That, nothing can be farther from the truth. God, who is greater than us, is also closest to us. He's not out beyond the far of the star, he's as close as your next heartbeat. He's right here with us right now. Psalm 16, eight, I know that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. Always with me, right beside me. That is comforting and troubling at the same time. You know what I'm talking about? It's, it's comforting, God's always there, I can always call on him, but it's also troubling. God's already always there. There's probably a few times in your life this last week where you think, could the always not be now, God? I mean, could it, you know, maybe right now, could you not be right beside me? Maybe you could be like next door for just a little while, but God says, nope, I'm always with you. I'm right beside you. Sometimes this is troubling to us because we want to do some things that we'd rather not have God notice. Like, he's not gonna notice. He knows everything. But we'd rather feel like he didn't notice. So we want to pretend that he's not right beside us. Sometimes that's the issue. But more often, the issue is, God is so great. He is so holy, he's so perfect, he's so powerful. We feel uncomfortable in the presence of someone who is so great. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, when he encountered God's presence in his life for the first time like this, you might remember what he said. He said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. He saw what he was. It's like looking into one of those magnifying mirrors. You know what I'm talking about? 
I don't want to look in one of those magnifying mirrors. I look bad enough in a regular mirror. I don't want it to be magnified. I don't want it to be bigger. And we feel that way about being in God's presence. I feel bad about myself already. If God's sitting right beside me, that really makes me look bad. But God says, I want you to enjoy my presence. When you look at the greatness of God's love, at all that he offers to you, there's something in all of us that, that wants to feel like the writer of Psalm 42 felt when he expressed this. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? This excitement about being in God's presence. Some of you know the verse before that says, as the deer pants for the water, my soul longs after you, God. Does your soul long after God? I think most of us would say, my soul, it longs for rest, it longs for peace, my soul longs for joy, for relaxation, my soul longs for strength, for significance. All those things are the things that God gives. And so when your soul, when you say my soul longs for peace or significance, you're really saying my soul longs for God because only God can give those things. Only God can give genuine joy, genuine peace, genuine significance. So when you long for those things, you are longing for God. But a lot of us, and even a lot of us who've been coming to church for a long time, we, we tend to find ourselves trying to quench those thirsts, this thirst of our soul in other ways. Because we're, we're a little nervous, we're a little doubtful about being too close to God. Something's got to change. And Jesus came to change it. Jesus came to help us to begin to think in a whole new way about God and who he is. And he did it with a single word. It's who he called God again and again and again, and it's who he taught us to call God as he taught us to pray. Jesus said, you really wanna understand who God is, how close he is to you? You wanna enjoy his presence? God is, Jesus said, your father. The Bible says this in Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. As Pastor Rick pointed out a couple of weeks ago, this is what Jesus taught us to call God, our Abba Father. And he reminded us that Abba is the most intimate name for a father. It's the close name that a child would call a father. The first name, Mama, Dada, Abba. One of the first words that a child could say. So it's this close, intimate, enjoyable relationship with God, our Father. A number of years ago, I was uh, in Israel and enjoyed, of course, seeing the places that Jesus walked and the places that Paul preached. But I think one of my favorite experiences was in a city park. We had gone there, the group I was with, to eat lunch. And while we were eating, there's a playground over here, there's some kids playing and parents watching the kids. Car drives up and a guy gets out in a business suit and starts to walk toward the playground. And this little three-year-old in, in the playground starts running across the grass, yelling the whole way, Abba, 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 because he wanted to be with his father. And I thought, that's it. That's the kind of relationship I want to have with God, this, this close, personal relationship with God. To rethink your view of God, some of you need to begin to see God as your father, as Jesus taught us. And I gotta tell you, as someone who was not very connected to my earthly father, a lot of you know that my father has mental illness, wasn't in the home very much, didn't have very many conversations with my dad. As someone who was not very connected to my earthly father, I can understand, I can certainly relate to the pain that some of you feel as I say that. You don't even wanna think about the word father. It's a painful word to you whether you call it a father wound or an absentee parent or just a bad deal that you got. You feel the pain of that. Your relationship with your dad did not set you up well to think of God as your heavenly father, trusting him. And if you've been through that, it is tempting to see God as anything but father. He's the Lord, he's the savior, he's the spirit, he's the big guy in the sky, whatever you wanna say, anything but father. I found that was not the answer that I needed. And I think Jesus tells us that's not the answer that we need. Instead of staying away from thinking as God as my father because of my pain, I needed to begin to think of God as the father that I never had. 
so that he could begin to heal my pain. Some of you need to begin to think of God as the father that you never had so that he can begin to heal your pain. We're gonna pray in a few moments at the end of this message, a prayer together about what God has said to us here. But I wanna pray now, before that even. I wanna stop, this is so important. I wanna stop and give you a moment to say to God, God, I do accept you as the father that I never had. You may feel like doing this, you may not feel like doing this, I'm asking you to take a step of faith with me and say to God, I do accept you as this father. Would you pray with me? And as we pray, as we begin, some of you need to tell God that you appreciate the father that you have and how they, although they were imperfect, they were an example to you. They were an example that led you to understand some things about your heavenly father. Just tell God, I'm grateful But a lot of us, that was not our experience. And I wanna ask you, if you've never really been able to think of God as your father, to join me in this, courageously join me in this prayer of faith. And just say, God, I now accept you as the father I never had. I was disappointed by my father, but you will never disappoint me. I never knew my earthly father, some of you may need to pray, but you want to get to know me. I was hurt by my earthly father, but I'm healed by you. I was ignored by my earthly father, but I have your full and constant attention. I could never meet the expectations of my earthly father, but I can find freedom from expectation in your grace. So I accept you as my heavenly father. In Jesus' name, Amen. This is such an important moment in some of your lives. It's worth pausing a minute and just applauding what God just did in people's lives. Because I know the courage it take to take that step for some of you. Now, as we come to the end of this, there's an important question we'll have to take a look at. And that is, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna start to think of God differently? It's one thing to say it's a good idea to think of God in a new way, but really, how am I gonna really change my thinking about this? And the Bible tells us, we've ended each of these messages actually just about the same way because it's where the power comes from. The Bible tells us there's two sources that help us to begin to think in a different way. God's word and God's spirit. If I wanna think differently about God, I need God's word and God's spirit. He wrote it down for me, he sent himself to me so that I can start to think differently about him. Luke 24, 45, the Bible says, then Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. When you think, I don't understand the Bible, this verse reminds us, you can ask Jesus, say, Jesus, would you open my mind so I could understand what you've written? The Bible is not a history book. It's got a lot of history in it, but it's not a history book. It's a love letter. It's a love letter. And you say, open my mind to see what you've written to me. You, you can't read somebody else's love letter and enjoy it. Maybe if you're a gossip, you can. But most of us can't. You, you're reading somebody else's mail. It's when you recognize it's written to you and you say, Jesus, would you help me to understand what you've written to me that you begin to see it opened up. That's one of the ways that you find the power to start to think differently is through God's word. We've given you in your program a list of verses about God and who God is, 10 different verses. I hope you'll take that list and read it through just once a day this next week. Just in your car somewhere, on your way to work, somewhere at home, starting the day, just maybe before you go to bed at night, just read it through once a day. And as you read it, say, Jesus, will you open my eyes to see, to understand your word? He will, he will. So God's word is one of the keys, and then God's spirit. God wants us to understand who he is so much, he sent his spirit into our lives. That's his promise when we decide to follow Christ. He sends his spirit into our lives to empower us, to empower our thinking. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 12, but God has given us his spirit. That's why we don't think the same way that the people of this world think. That's also why we can recognize the blessings that God has given us. So you ask God's spirit, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you show me what God is like in my daily life? I need, that's relying on his strength. I need your strength to do this. Now, as we come to the end of this message, after all we've said, 
I don't think we can say anything more than the verse that we began with. So I want to end with the same verse because God is greater than we can imagine. And then we're going to pray. And then we're going to sing together about God's greatness. There's something about singing that helps you to change your mind, change your thinking. It's a powerful thing. If you've never sung before, if you just sort of listen to everybody else sing, and you, want to, you really want to begin to change your mind, change your thoughts, I want to strongly encourage you, start to at least mouth the words. No, no actual noise needs to come out. Just mouth the words. Start there. And watch what God does. There's something about it that powerfully begins to change the way that we think about things. Let's end with this verse that we started with. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let's pray together. And I invite you to join me in this prayer of faith, making the commitment to do what we talked about together today. Just say to him, Father, I am deciding today. Maybe it's for the first time, maybe once again. I'm deciding today to trust the truth of what you've told me about yourself. And so, by faith, I accept, I take in your unconditional love for me. I appreciate, I value your awesome holiness. I trust that your judgment is always right. I understand that your timing is always perfect. I respect your powerful strength. And I want, I want to more and more learn to enjoy your wonderful presence. I make these commitments to you, God, my heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen.